The eye is a very special and specialized structure that allows us to have the sense of vision. Light will enter the eye through the clear area here in front called the cornea, and it's continuous with the white of the eye, which is known as the sclera. Now you'll notice that there are several extra ocular muscles on the eye. There are actually six of those. So they're going to allow the eye to move up, down, inside, outside, and a little bit of rotary activity, and it's going to allow the pupil to be directed towards the place we want to focus our vision. The pupil itself is the dark spot right there where light is allowed to enter the eye, and notice the iris is located surrounding it. Looking a little more superiorly, we'll take the top part of this model off here, along with this little bit of the cornea, and now we can see the iris and the gap in its center, the pupil. Now the iris can actually dilate, can open up wider to allow more light in, or constrict to narrow the pupil. And if we take a look on the inside here, we notice another important structure, and this is the lens. So the lens takes the light that enters the pupil and is clear but refractory, so it actually changes the angle depending on its roundness to make sure that it's focusing on the appropriate part of the retina. Now another important thing about the lens is that it creates several chambers in the eye, and here they're going to be located relative to the iris. So we've got our iris just here, and posterior here to the lens we have what's called the ciliary body, and that contains muscles that are going to allow the lens to round up or flatten out, and they're going to be pulled by these zonular fibers, shown here in white, that stretch the lens one way or the other. Just posterior to the iris is the posterior chamber of the eye full of aqueous humor that's created by this ciliary body and that is going to come across the iris and enter the space between the iris and the cornea and that is the anterior compartment of the eye so anterior compartment is anterior to the iris posterior compartment is posterior to it and posterior to all of it here the posterior area that contains the vitreous humor so the vitreous humor or vitreous body is kind of a gelatinous goo that's present in this area of the eye. So now let's take a look at the pathway light will follow as it's coming through. So light will travel through the cornea, has a little bit of refractory activity there, then through that anterior compartment full of aqueous humor, through the pupil of the lens, and then by the pupil of the iris, and then to the lens here, which will further refract it and focus the light onto the retina, which is the sensory area here. Now the retina is an extension of the brain, part of the hypothalamus, it extends off of that area, and it contains photoreceptors, along with many other cells that help to um, combine and strengthen the signals that are received by the retina. But these photoreceptors will eventually signal to what are called ganglion cells, and their axons will all converge here at our blind spot. That's going to be where the optic nerve forms. Cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve, is the collection of axons coming from each eye, from those ganglion cells, and that's what carries the vision to our thalamus and eventually, through a few relays, to our occipital lobe, the primary visual cortex. The ear is a very interesting sensory organ because it goes all the way from the outside of the body to the central nervous system and we'll start with our outer or external ear and hard to start without just looking at what we always think of when we talk about someone's ears, the outer part here, the oracle. Now each of these whirls or bumps has a name like the helix, anti-helix, the tragus. We're not going to sweat those right now. Just know that they do have names, but what we care most about is that from the ear canal, here we travel into a space. The ear canal or the external auditory or acoustic meatus traveling into there and it ends at this membrane, the tympanic membrane, more commonly called the eardrum. And that's what separates the external part of the ear from our middle ear, an air-filled space inside the temporal bone of the skull. Now the middle ear, we'll take a look at these structures in a more detail in just a second, but I want to note it's separated from the outside by this tympanic membrane, but it's connected to our nasopharynx by an auditory tube. And this is the tube that allows us to equilibrate the gas pressure in our middle ear with the outside. So whenever our ears pop, when we go up and down in altitude, it's because the air is allowing uh, itself to travel through this area 
and to equilibrate the middle ear with the external environment. Now, from the middle ear we move into the inner ear, and that's going to be a collection of sensory organs located in the temporal bone that give rise to the vestibular cochlear nerve, created under nerve 8, that allows us to sense hearing and vibration. We'll remove from the model here our tympanic membrane, and we can see that it's associated with the three ossicles in this model. Now we looked at the ossicles earlier in the central, uh, pardon me, in the uh, skull video, we looked at the bones of the skull, but here, let's just take a look a little closer at what the model is showing us here, and what we've got is the three ossicles present here. We've got the malleus on the actual tympanic membrane. And as the tympanic membrane moves like a drum in response to air currents and air pressure, it's going to rock the incus, this bone here, the second in command. And this is a point where the model kind of falls short, but understandably so. The stapes is a separate bone, but here it's just attached to the end of the incus. So the stapes is the third and smallest bone in the chain right there. And the stapes is going to move in response to movement of the other ossicles and push on what's called an oval window. And that oval window is our entry to the inner ear. The inner ear is incredibly complicated, so let's make sure that we can just do this in a comprehensible manner. But the inner ear is filled with fluid called perilymph, and if that weren't challenging enough, there's also a membrane inside of it that has a different kind of fluid with different ionic concentrations in it called endolymph. So we have perilymph and endolymph simultaneously present in the same inner ear structure. As the stapes hits the oval window, it creates a fluid wave in the perilymph that's going to shake sensory hair cells inside of our cochlea. Our cochlea is the structure that allows us to sense sound. So it's going to be where hearing is located. And that fluid from the oval window will set up waves that travel up the spiral of the cochlea, and then inside of it there's a secondary uh, turn that comes back around. If you think of a parking garage that spirals up one way, then at the very top you turn around and go back the other way. That's basically how the cochlea is organized. And from there, that fluid hits another window called the round window that basically depresses the fluid waves so that we don't have them reverberating back and forth. So the cochlea is going to send its inputs out through what is called the cochlear nerve. Now inside of it we have sensory hair cells that are hanging out in the fluid and when they shake due to sound hitting them at just the right frequency they will have channels open up that causes a nervous depolarization and tells us that we're hearing a certain pitch or a certain tone. Moving over here to the other part of the inner ear we have the utricle and saccule and semicircular canals. The utricle and saccule would be located in this area. It's not really well shown in here, but the utricle and saccule are going to tell us about our position relative to gravity. So basically they have a gelatinous kind of a membrane with little crystals in it called otoliths that give it a little bit of heft. And as they are pulled downward by gravity, they deflect sensory hair cells that tell us, or at least tell our central nervous system, about our position in space. So if I tilt forward, they're being pulled in a slightly different way. If I tilt to the left or the right, they're getting pulled in a slightly different way and send a different series of signals. Inside the semicircular canals, we have endolymph stuck in this area, and that endolymph, when we move our head, is going to run across in, uh, once again, sensory hair cells that are located in these little ampullae, these little swellings at the base of the semicircular canals. And if you look, these semicircular canals are set up basically in a three-dimensional X, Y, and Z axis. And if we put these back in place, we can actually see that there's going to be an anterior, a posterior, and a lateral semicircular canal. And the important thing about that is that no matter what direction we move, 
it's going to sense that change in acceleration one way or another. One of those directions will be affected, and we have two ears, therefore we might actually have input from both ears being integrated, allowing us to sense not just our position in space, but acceleration in response to change in our environment.